In the previous two videos, we looked at urban biodiversity and some of the misconceptions that have led cities to be overlooked in conservation. In this video, we will look at the shift towards including cities in biodiversity conservation, and specifically some of the actions that work towards their inclusion. So what does biodiversity conservation look like in cities? In a lot of ways, we can apply many of the same tools and concepts that we have been looking at in other landscapes throughout this course to cities. But there are also unique features of the urban environment that require unique actions for conservation to be effective. Although urban biodiversity conservation is a relatively new field, and it has only really taken off in the last 10 to 15 years, there are a few best practices and key actions that have started to emerge, which are listed here. Let's look at each of these key practices in more detail. As we have seen throughout this course, the general trend in conservation has been to think on bigger and broader spatial scales, even on entire continents like the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. This broad scale work is incredibly important to set the big picture for conservation but one of the drawbacks of it is that it is too coarse of a scale to pick up on the spaces that are of conservation importance in urban areas. The habitat patches and areas of conservation value in urban areas tend to be quite small, so they get lost in the coarser scale of broad scale planning, which tends to treat urban areas as homogeneous areas with very little, if any, conservation value. There is no single perfect spatial scale to use in ecology and conservation as each scale will tell us a different story and help us to answer different questions. So the point is that conservation planning needs to occur on multiple scales, but the most effective planning will occur when the plans at different scales are designed to fit into one another. Really effective urban biodiversity conservation planning will be designed to fit into more regional level plans. They should be designed to fill in the gaps of regional scale planning and to help make the connections across cities between key areas of regional importance. Related to the multi-scale nature of conservation planning and the need for connections between urban and more regional level planning is the need to consider connectivity in urban biodiversity conservation planning. Connectivity is not a new concept in conservation, and we discussed its importance in detail in an earlier week of this course but in urban areas, connectivity planning generally takes on one of two forms, though ultimately both are important. The first is the preservation of large patches of remnant natural ecosystems, often on the urban periphery. These areas act as important core habitat patches in and around cities, and they can often be used to make connections to landscapes beyond the city, and can be used as a way to link city-level conservation plans with more regional scale plans. The other form of planning for connectivity in urban areas is to look at the connections between these core areas in order to facilitate movement through the urban core. Oftentimes this requires the consideration of private lands, small spaces, and unconventional green spaces, which we will discuss on the next couple of slides. Most conservation efforts, at least in Canada, tend to happen on publicly owned lands. But given the nature of urban areas, the role of private lands in urban conservation cannot be understated. While municipalities often have ownership and control over most of the large core pieces of habitat in urban areas, the intervening spaces between them are generally privately owned. So private land tends to be critical for providing connectivity through cities. These private spaces tend to be quite small, which is one of the main reasons that urban areas tend to be dismissed by conservationists. But even very small landscape elements, such as a solitary street tree or a backyard pond, can provide critical habitat resources in the city and work to make the urban matrix a bit more hospitable. Of course, many species will still need a decent sized habitat patch to use as their home base, but the real value in small urban green spaces to meeting urban biodiversity conservation goals is in their cumulative impacts. If there are a number of small green spaces throughout the city, Cumulatively, they can work towards the critical maintenance of biodiversity in cities and can help to support connectivity between core habitat areas. Urban biodiversity conservation often requires us to think outside of the box. 
Typically, the starting place for urban biodiversity conservation is those spaces that look the most like the spaces that we're familiar with in conservation. Places like patches of remnant forest that survive the urbanization process, or maybe a lake near the urban core. Now these spaces are undoubtedly important for biodiversity, but they are far from the only spaces in cities with conservation potential. Over the last few years, research has highlighted the importance of spaces like golf courses, cemeteries, and even small roadside gardens to meeting biodiversity conservation goals. It turns out that they can support a number of different species and again, work to make the urban matrix a bit more hospitable. We can also think about how to redesign human infrastructure in order to be more supportive of biodiversity in the city. For example, we can use features like special streetlights that reduce impacts on nocturnal animals, road crossing structures, or green walls. However, it needs to be mentioned that effort must be taken to ensure that both form and function are being considered in these creative actions in order to prevent urban green infrastructure from becoming just another box to take in urban development projects. For example, a bird box is a relatively quick and easy win for designers. But are bird boxes serving birds or us? There is a need for constant monitoring of conservation efforts in cities, just like conservation efforts anywhere else, in order to ensure that what we are doing is working, and to make adjustments and adapt when we find that things aren't quite going as expected. Over the last decade or so, there have been several different frameworks developed to help guide urban design to better support wildlife in the built environment. Things like biophilic design and wildlife inclusive design. Although each of these frameworks is different, one thing that is clear across all of them and in the literature more broadly is that intentionality matters. While all types of green spaces have immense benefits on human health and community well-being, if we are talking about planning for biodiversity in the city, not all green spaces are equal. Just like you or I have preferences for what we want to see in green spaces, so too do different wildlife species. The point is that not all green spaces are equal, and we really have to consider more than just what color a space will be in satellite imagery if we want to support wildlife in the city. For example, it's one thing to plant more trees in the city with the goal of supporting wildlife, but it's another to intentionally plant trees that will actually be beneficial to wildlife. And the differences that our choices can make can be substantial. For example, researchers in Baltimore looked at the number of different caterpillar species that could be found on different trees, and what they found was rather remarkable. On the one end, they found that certain species of oak can support over 500 different types of caterpillars, but they also found that ginkgo, which is one of the most common trees planted on city streets, could support just three. And this has obvious implications for other wildlife in the city, starting with the birds that rely on different types of caterpillars as a food source. Around the world, urbanization is accelerating, placing increasing pressure on natural ecosystems. This includes the direct impacts in situ like habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation, as well as more ex situ effects via the city's ecological footprint which can extend far beyond the developed area of a city. There is a need to build future urban areas with improved outcomes for biodiversity in mind. At the landscape scale, this can involve systematic conservation planning to decide where to put new developments while avoiding areas critical for biodiversity. And at the site level, planning should include evidence-based urban design principles to develop neighborhoods that are more sensitive to the needs of biodiversity. In the last decade, a number of frameworks have emerged to help guide this neighborhood planning process. For example, Biodiversity Sensitive Urban Design is a framework proposed by Georgia Garrett and her colleagues based in Australia. It is based on the incorporation of ecological knowledge into urban planning and represents a shift towards biodiversity benefits being incorporated directly into site design throughout the entire urban fabric, rather than only being offset somewhere else through a land sparing approach. The framework is built on five key principles. Maintain and introduce habitat, facilitate dispersal, minimize threats and anthropogenic disturbances, facilitate natural ecological processes, and improve potential for positive human nature interactions. Similarly, Beta Pelbach and other researchers based across Europe developed wildlife inclusive design 
as a framework in which the needs of wildlife are integrated into the entire urban planning and design process, particularly in the already built up areas of the city. The main goal is to go beyond biodiversity conservation, only being considered in the early stages of city building. The idea that development should occur here and not there, and then becoming an afterthought. Through an ecology of cities approach, wildlife inclusive design seeks to integrate wildlife habitat throughout the entire urban fabric using four key principles. Interdisciplinary teams where ecologists are involved at every step of the process, consideration of the entire life cycle of target wildlife species, an obligatory post-occupancy phase where monitoring is conducted through adaptive management, and participatory approaches that inform and engage stakeholders.